Today's guest is a professor of philosophy, author of four books, and over the past 28 years has taught thousands of students. Today, she's going to share with you new insights, ideas, and information to stop self-sabotage. Would you please help me welcome our good friend, Peg O'Connor. Welcome. I love that applause, and I'm hoping you have a laugh track too. (laughs) Well, as I say, if they were here, they would do it. And I've got to do it on their behalf, and uh, they'll keep clapping for eternity because I hope that this content goes out and impacts a lot of lives. So we'll clap on their behalf today. Well, thank you, Daniel. My pleasure. Now, you've been a professor of philosophy for over 28 years. What was the dream that you started with, and what excited you about that dream? It actually kind of started with a, with a nightmare. It started with a serious misstep. <laughs> On, on my part. Um, so I graduated from college with absolutely no career aspirations. I was just beginning to sober up. I had tried to quit drinking many times while I was a college student, but finally quit because I had a terrible car accident. So necessity dictated that I quit. And I didn't know what I wanted to do. I, I loved being in school and I didn't know what to do. So I did what we do. I applied to graduate school. And I didn't even make it through orientation of my graduate program before I realized, oh, my God, have I made a terrible mistake. And I remember standing at a payphone. This was back in 1988, standing at a payphone, calling my parents to say I'd made this terrible mistake. I didn't belong in this graduate program. And my mother said, well, Peggy, everyone is entitled to make one mistake. And you just made yours. I'm like, Ooh, <laughs> OK, so. Then I realized I needed to be far more intentional in figuring out what I wanted to be studying. Being in school wasn't enough. What did I want to study? And it turned out I wanted to study philosophy. Philosophy is my first and true love in terms of academic pursuits. So I decided that I wanted to get a doctorate. I wanted to teach and I wanted to write. But it was really important to me that the philosophy I do, that it be useful that it engages with the real world, that it not be abstract and that it not alienate people, but rather that it invites people to think about the meaning of life in various Mm. kinds of ethical and social and political realities and problems that we face. So a lot of my early work was on oppression and responsibility. You know, what role do people who are variously privileged have for maintaining and reinforcing systems of oppression that leave people less well off and that fundamentally harm them. Mm -hmm. L. Ron Hubbard, uh, he founded Scientology. And in the foreword of a lot of his books, he says, if you're reading content or you're consuming information and you come across a word that you don't understand, you must stop and learn that word. And if you don't learn that word, your mind essentially stops here and everything learned after Uh, kind of just disappears, you know, the simplest terms. So I was looking at the word philosophy today, and I had never stopped to think about what actually philosophy was defined as or what it meant. I had my own internal representation and my own context, uh, complex equivalence, but I went and had a look at what it said in the dictionary, and it said a love of knowledge. Yes. And I went to myself, well, that's me. (laughs) I've heard of philosophy for so long, but now... It means I love knowledge. Yes, I I think that's absolutely right. And, you know, philosophy as it was practiced in the ancient world, say Plato and Aristotle, Socrates writing, philosophizing, you know, 400 BCE, 350 BCE. For them, the problems of philosophy were the problems of knowledge, sort of how do we come to know things? But one of the important things we need to come to know is ourself. So self-knowledge has always been an important part of knowledge, but with certain kinds of turns in philosophy, academic philosophy now very much doesn't really represent what had been the important questions for many of the earliest philosophers. So for me, philosophy is always about finding, making, discovering the meaning of life and making sense of suffering and transforming it, caring for your person, caring for your soul, caring for your moral character. Mm. So you started out with the telephone call. Uh, You were allowed one mistake from your mother. (laughs) You'd made that mistake early on. (laughs) And if you're going to make one, you make it a doozy. You make it count. 
<laughs> now, I, I say to my wife and my daughter, I say, all the mistakes of uh, my wife, let's track out. All the things she says, let's remind her of these things later on. We play this game mm-hmm. with her because she doesn't like to make mistakes. But along the way, what are some of those mistakes that you've made and what are some of those obstacles that you've had to overcome uh, on this journey? Well, I mean, I don't know if I would call it a mistake, but I I feel like I wasted a lot of my undergraduate education because I was a raging alcoholic. I started drinking in high school and I drank all the way through college. And I feel like I missed out on so many educational opportunities. And so for me now to be on the other side of the desk, when I see students struggling and certain students are certainly struggling with all kinds of mental health issues with substance use disorders. And, you know, I see myself in them, you know, that they stand at these turning points. They are, you know, where they are supposed to be, those stupid scare quotes that we use all the time. Mm -hmm. And they maybe don't want to be there or they don't know why they're there. And so I feel like much of my younger life, you know, because of my addiction was very unintentional and it was very chaotic and it was very self-destructive. And so, you know, my mistakes were massive in some kinds of ways. Um, And for me, the challenge was how to stop making those mistakes and starting to address more intentionally what kind of person I wanted to be and how I wanted to show up in the world. Because I certainly didn't like how I was showing up in the world when I was an active alcoholic. Did not like it at all. Mm -hmm. But that's who I was at the time. And so it's interesting now being in my late fifties, looking back at my, you know, late teens and early twenties, I finally have some compassion for that young person Mm. and, and sort of self-compassion is a wonderful achievement that may take a lifetime to realize. Mm. So, but then I also say, I describe myself as a grateful alcoholic, not just grateful for my recovery, but grateful for that malady because it shaped me. And it formed my character and it's let me know certain things about myself. I know that I will always somehow be okay. I won't always nail the landing. I might not land on my feet. I might land flat on my ass, but I know I'll get up either by my own volition and power or by knowing enough to ask friends to help me up. And that's an incredible achievement, but I could only realize that achievement by making all those mistakes. Mm. There's a Japanese proverb, and it says, fall down seven times, get back up eight times. Mm -hmm. However, what I see in my part of the world is a lot of people are so afraid to fall down. And oftentimes when they fall down the first time, they just never get back up. And it struck me the other day when I was doing a training and a student said to me, I've been leaving my career for 15 years. Now, I'm trying to process that sentence structure. I'm trying to leave my career for 15 years. And I said, well, did you leave it 15 years ago? He said, no, I've been trying to leave it for 15 years. And there was so much fear there for him. It was the fear of losing his financial stability. It was the fear of leaving the comfort zone. It was the fear of the unknown. It was the fear of trying and failing. And it appeared to me that it was the fear of the fear was greater than the actual leaving and possibly making a mistake. So it took him 15 years and he still hadn't done what he had done. Mm -hmm. And what I started to see this pattern in here was of people not trusting themselves. And when I read your article, it really resonated me. So I want to go back to your article and explore this article with you. And it's a wonderful article. Um, It's historic. It was written in 2014. And it's titled, Why is it so hard to trust yourself? So in the article, what you mentioned here was that a lot of people are constantly second-guessing themselves. They're changing directions. They're wanting something. And then they're sabotaging their own success. You know, in in your opinion and your years of experience, why do they do this? I think it becomes habitual. It becomes second nature. I think that for people who maybe have consistently received messages that you're not smart enough or who are you to be 
having these dreams and aspirations for yourself, or if you are, say, when I um, have some first generation college students that oftentimes they'll talk about nobody in my family has gone to college. Nobody ever thought it was even a remote possibility. You know, well, then who am I to be thinking that I can do something like that? And there's a there's a Stoic philosopher named Epictetus. And he said, one of the great achievements is knowing how to belong to yourself. So many of us will belong to others. We'll, be, we'll belong to the opinions of others that are higher than us. You know, our aspirational group will pay more attention to what others think of us, what they say about us, how we should be living our lives. And we'll put more trust in them than we ever put in ourselves. And so we don't belong to ourselves. We belong to the whims of others or we belong to imagine selves that we think we should have. And when we don't have those selves, we're going to pillory ourselves. We're going to punish ourselves. So that that lack of self-trust, I think, is one of the most insidious forms of self-sabotage there is. Mm. It's just too easy. And when you don't trust yourself, you're always going to have a certain kind of confirmation bias. Everything is going to count against why someone like you should be able to do this or why someone deserves to be happy. You know, if you're ever asking yourself, do I deserve to be happy? I'd say, oh my gosh, everyone deserves to be happy. What do you need to do to realize that happiness? Those are two very different kinds of questions. Mm. This triggers a couple of memories for me when I was an athlete. And I would go out and my brother and I would train together and we would jump on the trampoline, would go out in the water. And oftentimes I had this thought of, well, he can do it because he's slimmer, because he's lighter, because he's more compact. And I can't do it because I'm taller and I'm heavier and it's going to have a bigger impact on my body. And so I would have had more faith in my brother being able to do a trick than myself. Mm -hmm. But what made it more confusing was I could actually see the trick in my mind, explain it to somebody else, and somebody else could do it the first time, but I could follow my own advice and I could never land the trick. Like you mentioned before, I wouldn't land on my feet. I would assume that I would land on my face, therefore I didn't try. Oh, I, th I think that's a big part of it. So it's interesting you mentioned faith. I mean... Philosopher William James, so an American philosopher who lived around 1842 to 1910, he defined faith as a willingness to live where the results aren't certified in advance. It's the willingness to live on maybes and possibilities. And your willingness to believe and then act in certain ways will help to make fact. So when you have that little glitch or that gap and your willingness to believe that it's possible for you to do that, you are going to land flat on your face because you undo yourself because mm -hmm. you don't put in the full effort because you believe you can't do it. So he asked, he was talking about faith in the context of asking the question, is life worth living? And he was giving this address to a bunch of college students and he was talking about suicide. And he said, if you believe your life is worth living, that belief will help to make the fact that your life is worth living. So for James, faith should permeate every aspect of our existence. It isn't about belief in the God or gods or something like that. It's about, are you willing to live on possibility and maybes and take a chance when you don't know what the results are? Are you mm. willing to go for it? Mm. And that, I think, is an animating question for a lot of people to go back to your example of the person who for 15 years was trying to leave his job. I mean, I'm reminded of the Star Wars character Yoda, who says, there's no try, there's do. <laughs> do or do not. <laughs> do or do not. Yeah. There's something quite right in that. So here I am quoting Yoda. Go peg. Go peg. Now, it, it's fascinating. And in your article, you also mentioned that in some areas of our life, we might trust ourselves but in other areas, we might not trust ourselves. So I'd give myself complete faith as a coach to say, absolutely, you follow these three to five steps, yes. you will land the trick. But I couldn't apply that in other areas. I might not have that level of faith in my career, 
I might not even have that level of faith in the relationships I was in. Mm -hmm. And I felt that became quite confusing for me because it was like I had this inner conflict, almost like a devil on one shoulder and an angel on the other, the angel being my best uh, cheerleader going, Daniel, you can do everything you put your mind to. And the other one just laughing going, (laughs) Mm -hmm. go on, give it a try. But, you know, you can't try. (laughs) It's either you do it or you don't. Mm -hmm. And that felt very conflicting internally. And exhausting. It's exhausting when pieces of yourself are not just at odds, but warring with other pieces of yourself when you're so divided in that kind of way. Mm -hmm. That is going to sap your willingness. It's going to sap your belief in yourself. And I think part of the issue, though, is that to go back to that topic of fear, I mean, fear is opportunistic and fear spreads and fear breeds fear. And so what might be a legitimate fear in one small aspect of your life suddenly begins to grow where you end up with, there's this wonderful expression from a 19th century American mind cure. So the kind of forerunner to Christian uh, science who talked about fear thought. So there's forethought, which is very good. You're looking forward, you're being um, proactive, you're taking a, a very broad view of things, but fear thought, is what happens when you let fear and anticipatory fear of bad results be taken as so real that it starts to guide all of your decisions. So when forethought is replaced by fear thought, you become unable to move or you just kind of crouch down more into yourself because more things become objects of fear. Mm -hmm. More things become opportunities for failure. And that's a miserable kind of life to lead because you will always feel embattled. Mm. The enemy within. Ooh, and there's no escaping. There's no escaping that enemy within. That little sucker moves around with you because no matter where you go, there you are. (laughs) My my first boss would say, leave it at the door. And I'm thinking, leave it at the door? How do I possibly leave these fears, doubts, and limiting beliefs At the door, how do I detach from that? Even if I try to repress it, and this was going on in my most basic mind at 19, even if I repress it, it's still within me and it's going to show up. And as you mentioned about faith before, I often feel that I feel that a lot of people aren't people of faith. They believe in what they can see. Yes, I can see this phone. That's a phone. Mm -hmm. But these fears, doubts, limiting beliefs, I can't see them. Where are they? What do I do about them? Maybe it's not true. Maybe it's all in my mind. Mm -hmm. But then it's not visible. And I think it becomes confusing. Um, In in the article, and this was one that I had to reread multiple times and try to understand, it said, not trusting yourself is a hallmark of addiction. So this was a tough one for me to get my head around because I tend to hear addiction uh, in correlation with alcohol, sex, drugs, tobacco, pornography, and shopping. Could you help me understand uh, what addiction means in the context of not trusting yourself? Well, I think oftentimes no one sets out to become an addict, right? That's not an aspiration that anyone really has. And that oftentimes many people are reflective enough where they start to see where, say, they're going through their list of I will never, you know, I will never get in a blackout. I will never pass out. You know, you start moving through those lists. And so you start to come to see yourself as unreliable. You come to see yourself, if you don't already see yourself, as deeply flawed as being a problem, not just having a problem, but being a problem. And that you see a series of broken promises to yourself and to others, and you see yourself trade away maybe what had been life goals and aspirations, and you become unfamiliar to yourself. Mm -hmm. Addiction is a form of losing yourself. And so when you lose yourself, there's not really a self left there to trust. You know, that the the distrust, the lack of trustworthiness becomes so broad and so all-encompassing. And so I do think that losing self-trust is a hallmark of addiction. It's one of the earliest casualties in addiction. And it's one of the hardest things to get back 
because now there's going to be a built-in confirmation bias. I can look at, say, if someone's had a drinking or using career of 20 years, I can look at the destruction for the last 20 years and I see all the ways that I messed up. And, you know, why would I think that someone like me has something good about them or that I could do some good or that maybe I can keep a promise to my kid for the first time since I quit using? So self-trust disappears quickly and it's a very hard fought achievement when it returns if it returns, but I think it does return to people who put the work into it and sort of come to see that the way you build self-trust is by becoming trustworthy. And, you know, we talk about trust with other people. We don't talk so much about self-trust, but there, there's a kind of parallel there. Mm. I have to treat myself in a trustworthy manner if and only if I'm being trustworthy. What I hear from my students, they'll often say, Daniel, I look in the mirror and I don't like what I see. Mm -hmm. And we know they're not talking about the physical body. We're talking about the mental, the emotional, the, the, the spiritual part of them. And they look in the mirror and they don't like what they see. We also hear them say, I just don't know who I am anymore. I don't trust myself anymore. What are some of the ways, other ways that people could start to identify within themselves that they're not trusting themselves? Because I think for, for another example is people just stop setting goals. And they haven't set goals for years because they know I'm going to set a big, hairy, audacious goal. I did this. Right. I was 28. I'm going to start a business. I'm earning $50,000 a year. But in my first year of business, I'm going to make a million dollars. But it's my side hustle. And I set this big goal. And it was so ridiculous that even consciously I was laughing at myself. But unconsciously, I noticed that my behaviors weren't in alignment with it. I was totally conflicted. I knew it wasn't going to happen. How can I make a million bucks on a mm -hmm. side hustle if, I, if I'm working 40 hours a week earning 50K? And I felt conflicted. But it got worse over time because every day that I didn't do something, it got worse, the fear. Every year that I had to reset the goal, the lower levels of trust that I had in myself, I felt so incongruent. Oh, I think that's right. And, and I think being at war like yourself, being so incongruent is a special form of torment. I mean, we are all inconsistent in so many different ways. And some of them are completely harmless. They don't mean anything. But what happens when a person really starts waging war on herself where she says she wants one thing and she says she wants the exact opposite and they're mutually exclusive and you can't have both, but yet that person still keeps acting as if she can still have both, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we might all say, whoa, boy, that, that's you know, made a major form of self-deception, you know, wanting contradictory things and somehow still holding yourself to that standard of being able to do the impossible. So I think something like perfectionism and procrastination, they're all related here. So procrastination, I'll change my job, I'll change my career when, oh, my kids are in high school or I've paid off that debt. And you keep moving it out there. So what you say you want to change your profession and what you're willing to do to get it, there's a big, huge gap there. So procrastination is a way. And then I might say, well, I've had this goal, but yet I haven't seemed to realize it. Well, here comes that lack of self-trust. And, and I think perfectionism is another form of self-deception, that we hold ourselves to impossible standards, that we think we should be able to do everything perfectly. Maybe we don't think anyone else could, but we could. So we become you know, exceptional in our thinking to, to very bad effect, because mm -hmm. then we're always going to fail. And so if, if you are living in the world in ways where you set yourself up for failure every time by procrastinating or being a perfectionist, that's a very difficult way to live. Mm. Always being torn like that. So yeah, becoming congruent, becoming more consistent on the important kinds of things. That is an important kind of self-knowledge that comes from self-reflection, but it also comes from listening to the people around you whose opinions should really matter to you and who have good mm. insight on you mm. and that you can trust. It's, it's an interesting loop that perfectionism 
loop with procrastination. It's like an ongoing loop and there's no exit out of it. And it seems to snowball and get bigger yes. over time. And it, in, in my observation, it can also run cross-contextual. It can start in one area of your life oh, yeah. and then slowly over time creep over into another one until you're the last person to see it. And I know in your article you mentioned that, um, I forget the key word, um, I, I, I'd have to go back and have a look at it, but a lot of us can't see our own flaws, but other people can. Yes. There, was a, there was a key word, I forget what you used in there about that. I don't know, that's the kind of thing I can imagine, you know, every kind of mirror distorts, a, a plain mirror distorts. It turns it backwards, a concave mirror, a convex mirror, what you'd see in fun houses all distort. And I think oftentimes when many of us look inside ourselves, it is like looking at a fun house mirror. And so what we see versus maybe what is really there are two very different kinds of things. And sometimes we need people to hold up sort of more, well, I would say moral mirrors to us, you know, to mm -hmm. say, Daniel, I've known you all your life. You've always said you wanted these things, but now you're acting in these kinds of ways that our friends and our co-workers and people whom we admire are important in holding those mirrors up to us. And sometimes it's really hard. If some of us have such terrible views of ourselves, we know all the mistakes we've made, we know the havoc we've caused, the chaos that has reigned in our lives. We have a hard time believing others when they say positive things about us because we think, oh no, if you knew the real me, you couldn't possibly say that. But that real me is one of those distorted reflections. Mm. I, I had a conversation with a gentleman uh, who was suffering from body dysmorphia. Yeah. And the way that he saw himself in the mirror was not realistic uh, in comparison to, to what his body was. How he saw other people's body was out of proportion to how he would reflect on his own. And he said for his addiction, he would spend two to three minutes a day looking at himself in the mirror. But he wasn't looking at what was perfect. He was looking at all the imperfections. And then his addiction ended up being two to three hours per day staring in the mirror, only finding imperfection. Mm -hmm. And he'd done that for years, and he could no longer see himself objectively. It was very subjective. He saw all of his flaws, but even as a personal trainer, he couldn't see his strengths, just these limitations. Now, yeah, you, I, th I think that's the, that's the irony, mm -hmm. and, and, that's, and that's the tragedy. Mm-hmm. And so how to overcome that, how to be able to trust your ability to see and trust how other people see you. Oh, there we are back to that self-trust and other trust. Turns out those two are related, aren't they? <laughs> well, ah. Aristotle talked about trust as one of the virtues. Yes. And you said that there's two extremes. We can have excess and deficiency. So what is it? What does it look like or what happens when we have too much trust? And what does it look like and what happens when we have too little trust? So when we have too much trust, we give it too quickly. We give it too easily. We don't kind of do some due diligence in the people with, in whom or with whom we are investing our trust. We give it away too quickly. Mm. Um, sort of maybe a more contemporary term would be gullible. You know, you just, oh, well, so-and-so said it, it must be true. Or, you know, oh, well, I read this somewhere. You know, that it's, it's, it's what Aristotle says is a vice. And the absence of trust, having no trust, means that you just kind of wall yourself up. And it's kind of an assumption that there's nothing that you can learn or take from other people that you so kind of enclose yourself because trust is always a dynamic. It's always in relation. And so you kind of wall yourself out. So with too much trust, you spread yourself all out. You kind of overflow like a lake over a dam. And not enough trust, you kind of wall yourself in from all the things that are flowing on around you. So to know how to trust is to know how to prudently invest 
your willingness to believe in someone else or to believe in something, to be deliberate, to be intentional and, and not to treat it like it's disposable. Trust is precious. Mm -hmm. One of my mentors was talking to me about a convincer strategy. You know, how many times does it take you to be convinced of X, of something? And I've found over the years that if I was out socially, my ability to trust somebody, maybe they've got to prove trust four or five times before mm -hmm. I would say you're trustworthy and I can give you my trust. But in business for many years, if somebody come along and said, hey, I can do the job, I'd believe them straight away. And as fast as I would believe that they could do it, as soon as they screwed up, just like your mum, I'm going to give you one mistake, <laughs> I'd come down like a ton of bricks on them. And yep. it was a big conflict because I'd give it away so fast and I'd take it back so fast. And it was confusing, and, but it was only happening in that area of my life, which made it more isn't, confusing. Yeah, isn't that interesting where in one area of your life, you're like, yeah, you're really good with this. So I know with me and my professional life, very good with conflict. My personal life, ugh, not so good with conflict. But yeah, with, with trust like that, and I think to go back to our earlier conversation, that a lack of trust in one area can start to seep through to other areas. And mm. so, you know, what happens when that lack of trust becomes bigger or it becomes more, you know, more totalizing, if, if that's even kind of a word? Mm. Um, because we can't get along in the world without trusting ourselves and trusting others. But, you know, we certainly read and see enough, you know, why are cons so effective? It's because people are trusting and some people make really easy targets. So I think I read a study one time that said it's really highly educated, successful people who make the best marks in a long con because they think they're too smart to be duped. You know, they think they're always the smartest one in the room and no one would ever get anything over on them. So, yeah, how do we learn to assess situations and then make good decisions about where to place our trust? It's trial and error. Mm -hmm. You know, so fool me once, shame and on it's you. Hard, fool hard me twice. for a perfectionist, isn't it? How, how do you how do you say to a perfectionist it's trial and error? That that's a oh. tough concept for the perfectionist. Oh, it's a horrifying concept for a perfectionist, or to say progress, not perfection. It's like what? No, anything less than perfection. I mean, I know someone who had a very good mark benchmark for well that's good enough and for a perfectionist good enough is just so subpar it's a challenge i mean i think you have to start small and be okay with some things just being good enough my floors are vacuumed good enough not perfect <laughs> but good enough for what i need to do in order to utilize my space and you know not have too many allergy attacks mm. so what if what if i make promises to myself and i don't keep them what if I look at myself and see myself as untrustworthy? You know, what are the negative consequences to it and where can the problem ultimately lead to? So if, if it, not if, if I find myself untrustworthy, I found myself very untrustworthy. So let's not use, let's not use a hypothetical conditional here. You know, I find myself to be very untrustworthy. You know, I, I, I wasn't, meeting my goals. I wasn't putting my best effort in, or if I did, I put my best effort in for a week and I wasn't going to drink and then, oops, I'm drinking now, no longer best efforts and, and all those sorts of things. When I started to distrust myself, I found no reason to trust others. So it became even more isolating. I became even more isolated. So certainly my drinking and the ways I was drinking isolated me from others. And I wanted to keep away because I don't want people to know what a big problem I had, or, you know, I would get drunk and then in a blackout, you know, God knows what I did. And I would find out the next day and it would turn out, oops, I, you know, said something about someone else that I never, ever should have said. Um, I become less trustworthy to myself. I become less trustworthy to other people. And, and I found that seeing the estimation of certain others who I really liked and respected and wanted to kind of have good standing with. That's what really made me 
kind of slap my head and say, what, what am I doing here? I'm not being the kind of person that I want to be. I mean, I think many of us have little aha moments like that all the time. But the question is, do we pay attention to them? Do we give them any kind of weight? And we have a lot of incentive not to do so, because when we do pay attention to it, then we make that choice. So, you know, do. Don't mm. just try. I mean, it, it puts the responsibility right back on us again, where, where I think it appropriately belongs. Mm. Is it possible for people to change? We hear these quotes, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. We have limiting beliefs. Um, it's too late for me. It's too hard. Is it possible to clean this slate and start again? And, and if we could start again, how do we do it? Well, I, I do think it's possible because I see it all the time that people make really radical changes in their lives and they really can reorient themselves if they have the willingness to do what needs to be done. Mm -hmm. And the kinds of changes, you know, so I work a lot in addiction and recovery and the changes that I see in people are incredible you know, to such a degree that they really feel like I'm not that person anymore as I was when I was drinking or, you know, I'm not that person anymore who can't pay their bills or, you know, missed every weekend that I had with my kids. And now I'm the one at the games and they're coming to me asking for advice. I mean, those kinds of things, they happen all the time, but they don't happen by accident. They happen with intention. They happen with willingness to do the work and to ask others for help. So it's too easy just to say, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. You, you sure can, old dog. You can learn new tricks. Um, so I, I, I think putting the focus back on what is within the control of each person is really crucial. I mean, it's very important to know what you can control and what you can't control. And so if you kind of Control what you can, which is your attitude and your willingness and your intention. Even though there may be things in the world around you that don't change, you can change. You can change your attitude. That's well within your control. And, and I don't mean to sound like that's tough love, but it that's what it is. Well, I think there's certain realities when it comes to change. I met a company uh, at the start of the pandemic and they uh, had become loose in their operations. They become too relaxed. Success was too easy and they mm -hmm. didn't keep up those good habits. And we had a conversation. We said, look, the majority of the businesses in your industry will collapse. They will fall over because of logistics, because of X, Y and Z. But how do we prevent that? And we boiled it down to two things. And it's exactly what you said here. We can boil it down. You have complete control over your attitude. And I said, you can approach COVID-19. You can approach the pandemic any way you choose. Your attitude, your angle of attack. And you can control your level of action. So they decided that if they were the two things that they could control, then to the best of their ability, they'd put their blinders on and block out all the other bullshit. So they put the blinders on and they got busy. And then a year later, they called me and they said, Daniel, you wouldn't believe it. We, I said, well, I would, because <laughs> I know these things happen. They said, we're in an industry where people make 600 telephone calls a month. We ramped up our actions to 6,000 telephone calls per month. Oh, and we just kept focusing on what we could control, which was our attitude and our actions. And they said, just doing that alone, it made a $2 million improvement in their business in the worst economy the country's ever seen. As their uh, competitors were falling off, disappearing off the face of the earth, they were rapidly growing. And they just paid attention to those two things. And it didn't happen like 6,000 calls in one day. It no. was just that small habit of, you know, a couple of calls Every hour, a couple of calls every hour, a couple of calls every hour, a couple of calls every hour until they had that track record of success and mm -hmm. they started to breed it within each other and that emotion took over and that emotion became contagious and they started to get that belief back and eventually they trusted themselves and the reward, and there was many more than just the money, but the one that they could measure very easily was the $2 million improvement in their business. Right. 
Too so I, I would come back and say they had faith in the possibility, right? The, the result was not certified in advance, but they had faith and they took action. Faith always has to be combined with action. If it's not, it's just a, a pretty ornamental knob that spins. Pretty to look at, but doesn't do anything. <laughs> it's like the, uh, the full card in the tarot deck. <laughs> He's about to take the leap of faith. <laughs> but he jumps and he trusts in the process and he knows that the net will appear. But it's not foolishness. It's that inner wisdom knowing that if I take this leap of faith and I take the desired action, I'll end up landing on my feet. And if not, I'll learn a lot on the, on the fall on the way down. <laughs> yeah, it's an opportunity. So I think that that's one of the things when you trust yourself, you see opportunities as welcome because they could bring good things. But when you completely don't trust yourself and you don't trust others, opportunities will always bring bad things to you. And it becomes a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy. I love those self-fulfilling prophecies. I've had some good ones ah. and I've had some uh, not so good ones. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but they Stick always the came ones. true. <laughs> now, you've got a new book coming out very shortly. And here it is. It's called Higher and Friendly Powers. When's the book coming out? And what are we going to learn from the new book? Well, the book comes out on August 15th, so it's now available for pre-order. And this book uses the philosopher William James that I was talking about earlier. And the concept of higher power is one that is very common in Alcoholics Anonymous. And it's oftentimes equated with a god, and it's a Christian providential god. And that term higher power came from William James, and he always talked about it in the plural. So he said, you know, what do you need in order to have the opportunity to make a big change or to make big changes yourself? You don't need a God making changes for you. Anything larger will do if it helps you to take the next step. And he said, it could be ideals like truth and beauty. It could be a sense of human decency or faith in mankind. It could be patriotism, moral principles, or it could be the belief that you have a better you. So Every single one of us perhaps has a higher power within us. It has nothing to do with a God. And so to go back to your earlier question, really radical, significant change is possible and that we each have within ourselves the, the power to, to make those changes. So it's, it's meant to help people who struggle or those who love or work with people who struggle with addiction really radical choices about living a life in recovery where one is, this is language from William James, you're reborn, you're rejuvenated, or you're regenerated. You become a new person because your axis, your, your center of energy changes. So it's, mm -hmm. it's really exciting to be bringing back a philosopher who is writing about fundamental radical change um, and bringing him back into contemporary discussions. Well, I believe anybody can change and we can benefit from it. You know, if um, the Colonel, Colonel Sanders from KFC had given up on his goal, we wouldn't have had so many KFC meals over the years. And he was, was he in his late 60s when change took place for him? Because he had struggled for years and he made that decision and he said, this yep. is what's going to happen and I've got absolute faith in what I'm going to do. And yep. uh, thanks to the Colonel, I've had many nice KFC meals over the years. Maybe not healthy. <laughs> But, but you've had them good. and you've enjoyed it. <laughs> and I remember his name. You know, the, the colonel, they said in marketing, was one of the most universally recognised faces on the planet. Yeah. And it didn't happen until, in, until his later years. So, ladies and gentlemen, what I want you to do, I want you to go over to pegoconnorauthor.com. I want you to pre-order Higher and Friendly Powers today. And I'll also place the notes and the link in the show notes below. Now, Peg, for anybody who is now thinking, you know what, I think I'm another step closer to trusting myself, what would be some final thoughts that you would share with them so they could start to do one thing today where they could just trust themselves today and begin that new journey? I think everything starts small when you're talking about making a radical change in your life. You've got to start small. So don't have that unmeetable goal because you won't meet it. And then you'll have all the more evidence to beat yourself up with. So start with small promises. So I know someone who was trying to quit drinking and he did it 
by saying he had to drive by several liquor stores on his way home. And he would say to himself, well, I can go a different way and not pass all the liquor stores. So that's one thing you can do. And he said the other thing he would do when he had to come home a certain way, he would make himself, well, I'm going to see if I can just pass this one. And then he'd pass it and then he'd come to another one. And oh, I'm going to see if I can pass this one. And he would get home. And so that's actually how he started building his sobriety was by just saying, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to just see if I can get past this one, this one liquor store. And so, you know, in terms of, of, of trusting yourself to start small and pick something maybe that has some consequence, but isn't too major. And then when you do something, when you hold a promise, when you make a promise to yourself and you keep it to explicitly acknowledge it and not minimize it or write it off. You know, you've got to start filling the other half of that ledger book. So here are all the ways maybe that you are untrustworthy. You've got to start balancing the scales. And I think, you know, keeping a record of, of when you are trustworthy because that confirmation bias, you're going to be more likely to continue to think of yourself as untrustworthy. It's work. It's work. But it's good work and that it feels good. Hmm. Words of wisdom. Peg, thank you so much for sharing uh, your energy, your insights, and especially your opinions. And I love to uh, hear those opinions, but also the vulnerability. And in academia, oftentimes we don't hear this vulnerability. So really refreshing to have experienced well, that here today. So ladies and oh, gentlemen, I, my pleasure. I want you to go to Peg O'Connor author.com. The link is in the show notes and pre-order your book, Higher and Friendly Powers. Ladies and gentlemen, remember, one new idea at the right time is enough to change your life. Have a wonderful day. Wow, Peg, thank you so much.